Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to U.S. History Through Film. Today, we'll be talking about a war that was a great victory for the British Empire in North America, but also turned out to be the beginning of the end of the British Empire in North America, the French and Indian War, which we'll be looking at in part through the film The Last of the Mohicans. Now, from the time English colonists arrived in America, um, they fought with the Indians from time to time in the 1600s, and as the um, 17th century grew close to an end, European colonists in America and their Indian allies were increasingly pulled into wars that had begun in Europe. In North America, what was known amongst the English colonists as King William's War was fought from 1689 to 1697, what in the Americas was no, um, known as Queen Anne's War uh, was fought from 1702 to 1713. Uh, this war was known in Europe as the War of Spanish Succession and had begun um, over who ought to inherit the throne of Spain. Um, the, the former royal family of Spain, the Spanish Habsburgs, had done something that was perhaps unwise. Now, I'm not going to tell you not to marry your cousin, but I would encourage you not to have your family do it generation for generation for 200 years for fear that you may produce someone like King Charles II, the last Spanish Habsburg. Um, in centuries of inbreeding, it produced a man who was physically deformed, with a jaw so enlarged he could barely eat solid food. He was um, deformed in other ways, moderately retarded, and apparently sterile, although perhaps that was for the best. And when he died, there was a war over who ought to inherit the throne of Spain, um, there being Habsburgs in Austria, but the King of France, um, having married a Habsburg princess in his youth, and thus his uh, descendants, he felt, should inherit Spain, and eventually they did, um, and still rule it today. Now, the treaty that ended this war did not really satisfy anybody in Europe. Um, for one thing, the British continued to smuggle um, goods into Spanish colonies in the Caribbean. Till in 1731, Spanish Coast Guard captain boarded the English ship Rebecca, searched the ship for smuggled goods, and upon finding some, approached the captain. Um, who said, my king shall not stand for this. The Spanish captain pulled out a sword, chopped off Captain Jenkins' ear, said, take that back to your king. And eventually, he did. Some years later, when the English government was kind of looking for an excuse to go to war with Spain, they brought out Jenkins' ear, which he had pickled and saved in a bottle. It was shown around England. Apparently, the English prime minister, Robert Walpole, fainted upon seeing it. Um... And so this began the War of Jenkins' Ear, which pretty soon merged into a larger war over who ought to inherit the throne of Austria, where the last ruler had died without any sons. Now, the law in Austria, unlike the law in England and France and some places, was that a woman could not inherit the throne, um, only a man. But the last ruler had died with only one daughter um, among, as his child, uh, Maria Theresa. And he had gotten in advance other rulers of Europe to agree to accept her becoming ruler of Austria. But when she actually did, some tried to oppose her. Um, some on grounds of legality, most in hopes of seizing all or part of her territory. This war of Austrian succession spread to America, where the English colonists called it King George's War, after the king of Great Britain at the time. Um, one of the most important events during this war, from the point of view of the British colonists, was that in 1745, militia from New England went to Canada, then a French territory, um, laid siege to and captured the mighty French fortress of Louisbourg, which um, was not only an important fortress in its own right, but guarded the entrance to the St. Lawrence River. If the British controlled that, they could sail all the way up the St. Lawrence River and threaten Quebec and Montreal and other French settlements along the river the major French settlements in North America. Um, so a great victory, but, uh, but when the war ended, um, many countries in Europe swapped back land they had captured from each other, so that really little land ended up changing hands in the long run, and Fort Louisbourg was one of the territories returned to France. And many New England colonists um, resented this, feeling that their, their great triumph uh, had been wasted, had not been appreciated. Now, by the mid-1700s, um, British colonists in North America were increasingly jealous of the French. 
and the French were increasingly worried about the British. Now, in terms of population, the British colonies in North America had grown rapidly since their foundation in the early 1600s. By 1750, there were about one and a half million people in Britain's colonies, but those were confined to a relatively narrow area um, along the eastern seaboard, um, hemmed in by the Appalachian Mountains, beyond which was territory claimed by the French. Um, on the other hand, during the 16 and 1700s, the French government may have claimed a lot of territory in North America, but hadn't done much to encourage settlement there. At times, it even placed restrictions on settlement. Um, out of fear that if too many French people moved to North America, they might become too independent. So that's 1750, in contrast to one and a half million British subjects in North America, there were perhaps 50,000 French um, people, most of them concentrated in a few moderately large cities, in such as Quebec or Montreal or New Orleans. Most of the rest were traders and fur trappers and missionaries, scattered out amongst many tiny settlements um, and trading posts uh, across North America. Although, because there were so few of them, and they didn't try to occupy much land, um, for the most part they got along much better with the American Indians, um, although, uh, although certainly with some exceptions. And British colonists increasingly coveted France's possessions, uh, in part because most colonial land claims for the British colonists technically ran to the South Sea, which kind of meant the Pacific Ocean, before they exactly knew how to get to the Pacific Ocean, or at least what lay between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, Virginia, in particular, claimed a very large um, area, not just what's now Virginia and Kentucky, but also um, what's now Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, parts of Minnesota, uh, indeed parts of, uh, parts of Pennsylvania. Um, and New York and other colonies. Um, and in, around 1750, um, a number of prominent Virginians, including Lawrence and Augustine Washington, the royal governor Robert Dinwiddie, and others, formed the Ohio Company of Virginia with the intent of claiming and settling land in the Ohio River Valley um, for farming um, and for fur trapping and trading. And 1753, the Ohio Company sent Lawrence and Augustine Washington's little half-brother, George, um, into French territory to tell the French to leave. He traveled to Fort Leboeuf, just south of Lake Erie, told the French to go, which the French responded by saying, non. And they began construction um, of a more advanced fort a little bit south of there, which they called Fort Duquesne, um, where modern-day Pittsburgh is. Washington was sent back to um, to this area one year later with some militia in hopes of forcing the French out. They approached Fort Duquesne in May of 1754, actually ambushed a group of French soldiers uh, sent out to um, try to stop him and defeated them in that ambush. Um, but Washington knew there were more French soldiers stationed nearby and ordered his men to build a fort of their own, which they called Fort Necessity which the French attacked July 3rd, 1754. Outnumbering Washington's men about 600 to 400, Washington was forced to surrender the next day. Um, July 4th, 1754, um, not the best July 4th in his history. Um, but while Washington was defeated, losing about a third of his men, and sent back to Virginia, he showed such bravery under fire. Um, indeed, was one of the few Virginians who have fought the French at all, that his reputation grew. Um, as a military man, and as the war that this began um, dragged on, he led Virginia militia in defense of the frontier against the Indians, um, and occasionally fought alongside British officers um, in major campaigns. But his colonial rank of colonel was not recognized. The British would not recognize any colonial militia rank above captain. Um, and so he felt slighted, felt insulted, um, as did many colonial officers and other leaders. Um, and British officers and soldiers in general believed they were more professional uh, than the Americans they were working with. And to be fair, that was often true, although not always. And the British in turn would sometimes prove pretty incompetent at fighting in the wilderness, which American militia knew how to do. Although when I say American, I want to emphasize that while they lived in America, these British colonists still saw themselves definitely as British.
And while they may have been unhappy with um, specific policies of the British, they were very proud to be part of the British Empire. Uh, this little battle um, at modern-day Pittsburgh um, over access to farmland and fur trapping in the Ohio River Valley um, developed into what in America was known as the French and Indian War, not because the French were fighting the Indians, um, but because the British were fighting against the French and some Indian nations, although other Indians sided with the British. Um, but just as wars in Europe had spread to America in the past, this war now spread to Europe, indeed to European colonies around the world. Some have described this as the First World War. In Europe, it is known as the Seven Years' War, as it began two years later and did last for seven years in Europe. And again, elsewhere in the world, in South Asia, for example, um, the British were fighting um, the French and the Indians as well, just a different kind of Indian. Um, um, again, uh, again, there were Indians on the side of the English. Uh, in, and the most important of these groups were the Iroquois Indians um, based around the Great Lakes, especially in New York. Um, and um, they had a long-standing alliance known as the Covenant Chain um, with the colony of New York uh, and the British in general, which the British maintained in this war um, through um, a very large, a very large quantity of gifts, many wagon loads of gifts, which sounds nicer than bribes, sent to the Iroquois, um, starting in 1754. 1755, about a year into the war, the British government sent the highly experienced general, Edward Braddock, to North America with several thousand men. Um, when the French heard about this, they sent 3,000 troops of their own to defend New France. Um, Braddock's plan was to return to Fort Duquesne and capture or destroy it. The French, in turn, strengthened this fort and stationed more men there, which in turn Braddock knew about thanks to British spies and Delaware Indians uh, assisting the British. So he tried to bring a bunch of very heavy cannons uh, to destroy the walls of Fort Duquesne. Um, but he had to take them 110 miles through the wilderness. And so they had to cut a road um, through the wilds of uh, western Maryland, uh, what, what's now West Virginia, and into western Pennsylvania. Braddock led about 2,000 men. Um, including Daniel Boone, who served as a wagon driver, um, and George Washington, who was along uh, as an assistant to General Braddock. Now, Braddock had a lot of men. They were moving slow as they cut their road. Um, the cannon slowed them down further. Indeed, there were many cases where some of his soldiers marched well ahead, and the cannons dragged along behind, and from time to time his other soldiers would have to stop and wait for the cannons to catch up. Furthermore, they were wearing bright red uniforms, which stood out in the forest. Um, and so, when, on July 9th, 1755, they ran into a much a smaller group of French soldiers and their Indian allies, Braddock's men were caught completely off guard. Historians debate whether this was um, a deliberate ambush by the French or whether the two groups just blundered into each other, um, but the French handled it well and Braddock poorly. Indeed, the Battle of the Monongahela, after a nearby river, um, is commonly known as Braddock's Blunder. Um, as, again, the, uh, the troops marching well ahead of the, of the other soldiers pulling the cannons and were caught off guard um, as they tried to fire in, in ranks, one line firing after another in turn. They were cut down by French and Indian um, warriors fighting from behind the trees. Um, Pretty soon, um, Braddock's men were confused, um, at, and Braddock himself uh, was wounded badly um, and died a couple days later. Washington now took charge, uh, managed to rally some of his men, but they were forced to retreat. Although without Washington, um, the retreat probably would have been even more chaotic. Even more men might have been killed, or all of them might have been captured. At least 500 were killed and left to rot. Their bleached bones were still visible to other armies passing through um, several years later. Uh, about 500 more British soldiers were wounded, in contrast to which 40 French and Indians uh, were killed or wounded in the battle. When Braddock died four days later, 
Um, he was buried in the middle of the road his men had worked so hard to build, fearing that if they left his body um, in a more visible grave, that uh, the Indians might dig it up and desecrate his corpse. Uh, so he was buried in the road, and his army marched across it. Um, although many, many years later, about 60 years later, when that road, which people did use, was being improved, his body was discovered uh, and buried in a um, grave a bit off the side of the road, which you can now visit if you're in that part of West Virginia. Again, in 1756, um, France and England officially went to war, as did all their allies in Europe. Now, in New France, the overall military commander was the Marquis de Montcalm. Um, and he would prove to be, for the most part, a very effective commander, despite the fact he had to deal with a lack of support from France, where King Louis XV was focused on the fighting in Europe. Um, he also had to deal with the governor of New France, Marquis de Vaudreuil, who wanted to be commander-in-chief as well. Um, the British in America um, also were at first pretty indecisive, uh, indeed much uh, less effective than the French to begin with as the British government could not decide whether they wanted to focus on the conflict in Europe, um, trying to fight a limited war, or if they wanted to fight a global war. And if so, which part of the globe to focus on? But in 1757, William Pitt became, uh, or, or came to be in charge of the colonial war effort, or the entire British war effort, my apologies, uh, and decided that the war could best be won um, by focusing on North America. That would be the real prize. Um, although it would take a while for that to pay off. Um, indeed, for the rest of 1757, uh, the French seemed to have all the advantages. They had stopped almost all the British advances into French territory, had even captured some territory from the British around the Great Lakes. Uh, their Indian allies raided settlements along the frontier, killing, looting, and taking captives. Captives in turn, um, might die on the march back into French territory. Um, others might be killed outright. Some were tortured to death. Indians loved torture, at least for others, feeling it was a form of public entertainment and opportunity for a prisoner who should be embarrassed by his capture to demonstrate his bravery by enduring the torture, um, which might involve such things as having gashes cut in their flesh, which were packed with gunpowder, which itself burns, like having salt stuffed in a wound. The gunpowder would then be lit on fire, blowing little craters in your flesh. Um, or pine splinters might be stuck under your skin, um, which were then lit on fire. Captured soldiers or others might be forced to run a gauntlet between two lines of Indian warriors and others, um, even women, who would hit them with clubs and sticks, the butt ends of their, of their uh, rifles and muskets, uh, even frying pans if they, um, for women who had them. And if you survive that, you might have to run again. Um, one, uh, one of my favorite cases was a hunter um, captured in Indian territory, forced to run the gauntlet. But he was a big guy. He grabbed a skinny Indian and flung him across his back. And the Indians hit that guy instead for being dumb enough to get caught. And the, the Indians certainly admired bravery. Um, a prisoner who survived the gauntlet or otherwise um, befriended or impressed the Indians might be adopted into the tribe or occasionally released and many were ransomed back um, by their families or by colonial governments. Um, now, the British did make plans to attack Canada, but they were pretty slow in getting underway. Indeed, gathering up troops for a potential invasion left some parts of the frontier poorly defended. Even some British forts were undermanned, such as Fort William Henry, which is on the shores of Lake George, just south of Lake Champlain. Um, one of the major routes between um, Canada uh, and New York, uh, and New England as well. Fort William Henry, on the front lines, was held by about 600 regular British soldiers, about 1,200 militia. When Montcalm and his Indian allies, about 8,000 men in total, laid siege to it in the summer of 1757. And the fighting around Fort William Henry plays an important part uh, in the movie, The Last of the Mohicans. This, is, this film was released in 1992. 
it is loosely, very loosely, based on a book of the same name by James Fenimore Cooper, published in 1826. Um, Cooper was the first best-selling American novelist, and Last the Mohicans won uh, one of his real hits, one of many hits. Um, this book was, in turn, very loosely based on events in 1757 during the French and Indian War. Um, again, loosely based on facts, the movie, in turn, loosely based on the book. Um, almost all of the major characters are fictional, but in producing the movie, a lot of attention was paid to the accuracy of the costumes, the weapons, and other props. They're not perfect. There are some British soldiers shown wearing uniforms that are a couple of decades off, but overall things were, were very good, uh, sometimes too good, during filming, which was actually in North Carolina and not upstate New York as it was originally, uh, originally taking place. Um, many actors suffered badly from heat stroke because they were wearing accurate wool uniforms during long days of filming. Many of the actors, even background characters, were given military training. Some even received modern hand-to-hand -hand combat training by a U.S. Army officer. And the actor portraying the main character and prepared for the film in part by going and living off the land in the wilderness to get in the right frame of mind. Many American Indian characters, almost all of them, are portrayed by American Indian or Canadian Indian actors, although not necessarily um, from the actual tribes that they are meant to represent. A lot of them were Cherokee. Um, they do speak, for the most part, Indian languages on screen, but not usually the language of the tribe they're portraying, the most speaking Cherokee. In other ways, though, um, the Indians' clothing and body paint and weapons are very accurate. Um, as is a scene early in the movie where they're shown playing a type of lacrosse, which was originally an Indian sport, uh, and one so violent it was known among some tribes as the little brother of war. And speaking of language, many characters in the movie are portrayed as multilingual, which is not unusual on the frontier, with the English, the French, the Dutch, who had once claimed New York. And of course, multiple American Indian nations came together um, to trade and occasionally fight with each other. Furthermore, most educated Europeans, um, such as many of the um, military officers shown, um, had learned foreign languages in school. Um, so when characters switch back and forth between two or more languages, certainly that's for the convenience of the movie, but also not necessarily inaccurate. As I mentioned, while the movie is set in northern New York, it was filmed in the mountains of North Carolina, including a couple scenes at Biltmore. Um, it was felt that the forests of the Great Smoky Mountains looked more like the forests of pre-industrial New York whereas by the early 1990s, New York State still showed signs of the very heavy logging that took place there in the 18 and early 1900s. All to be fair, there was pretty heavy logging in the Southern Appalachians around that time, too. One of the main characters um, is Nathaniel Poe, a fictional character, um, an expert hunter and fur trader on the frontier. Uh, he's also nicknamed Hawkeye. In the books, that is what he's more commonly called, in fact. Some of the French call him the, the Long Carabine, or Long Rifle, referring to um, the rifle, the uh, Pennsylvania rifle, which, uh, which he carries. This was a hunter's weapon. Um, a rifle, as pictured above uh, in this slide, um, was much more accurate than the muskets um, shown below because it had grooves carved into the barrel at a slight turn. A ball shoved down a rifle would grip those grooves as it came out um, and have a spin on it, a spiral, which made it fly um, straighter, be more accurate to a longer distance, which was important for a hunter, but not so important for soldiers, um, whose goal was simply to line up and fire as many shots as they could. Um, because the ball has to grip the barrel and the rifle, it's a bit harder and slower to load. A musket with a smooth barrel that the ball doesn't have to grip could be loaded more quickly. British soldiers, um, if they properly followed their training, could fire four shots a minute. Um, a rifle, one or two shots, um, even if you were in a hurry, which of course hunters usually weren't. Um, um, according to the story, Nathaniel Poe's parents were killed when he was very young, and he was adopted by a Mohican Indian named Chingachgook, uh, who's a fictional character. 
Nemohikanim, an Indian, the adoptive father of Nathaniel, biological father of Uncas, who we'll see in a moment, also a skilled hunter and fur trader. In the movie, he used a gun, a gunstock war club, and a war club shaped like the wooden stock of a gun, um, with a big piece uh, of sharpened stone in the back end uh, for whacking his enemies with. And um, this was, was an accurate type of weapon. The, uh, the Indians, or at least some, carried war clubs like this with a sharpened point um, near the back. The, uh, the way a flintlock rifle of this type works um, is that the flint that gives it its name, in both for the rifle um, and the musket, is located near the rear. Flint is a type of stone that can be sharpened um, to such an extent that it can cut through steel. And so the flint is held by a, by a hammer on a spring. It springs forward and hits a piece of steel called the frizzen. Sparks of molten steel fall into a small pan called the flash pan, where there's a little bit of gunpowder. Uh, that gunpowder explodes, and some of it goes through a small hole called a touch hole um, into the main barrel of the rifle, where it lights off the, the main charge of gunpowder, causing the, uh, you know, the gunpowder to explode, creating a gas, propelling the bullet out of the barrel. Pardon me, the ball. We don't yet have bullets, um, which are conical uh, and more accurate. But again, that wasn't um, that big an issue at this point. When um, that first explosion takes place in the flash pan, it means the first thing you see when a flintlock gun is fired is a big flash of flame and smoke near the back. And so when such things were first encountered by some American Indians, they actually believed that was the dangerous part of the weapon. And so and some war clubs were made um, to, uh, made, pardon me, to um, emphasize. Another interesting point um, is that the actor portraying Chingachgook um, this Russell Means, um, who actually later in his life portrayed a number of American Indian characters in movies, um, including the voice of Pocahontas in the Walt Disney cartoon Pocahontas. But he was also um, a famous um, political activist and leader of the American Indian movement, um, founded in 1968 to try to win equality um, for American Indians. They famously seized Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay and held it um, from November of 1969 to June of 1971. I'm um, saying because it was federal land, it was land that had been stolen um, from the Indians. And even today, should you visit Alcatraz, you'll see AIM for American Indian Movement painted very prominently on the side of Alcatraz Island. 1973. Uh, Russell Means and the American Indian Movement fought with federal agents at Wounded Knees, South Dakota, where two Indians and two federal agents were killed at the site of what's typically considered the last battle of the Indian Wars, the Battle or Massacre of Wounded Knee, in December of 1890. Uh, again, Russell Means was involved in both those activities. Um, and later on, he came to portray American Indians in many films. Some people felt he had sold out. But he felt that he was um, portraying such characters honorably, you know, getting a paycheck as well. Uh, his son, biological son, is Uncas, also a fictional character. Um, and he is played by a man named Eric Schweig, who, despite that Germanic name, was a mixed race man of Eskimo, Indian, and European descent uh, from Canada but he was taken from his mother as a child and forcibly adopted into a white family in Canada um, as part of a Canadian policy at the time to force their Indians, or as they call them, First Nations, to assimilate into white society. John Cameron and, and his family in the movie are fictional characters representing a frontier, a frontier family in upstate New York who are friends with Chingachgook and his sons. Major Duncan Haywood, Hayward is a fictional character, an officer in the British Army. Um, incidentally, an officer in the 60th Regiment of Foot, which is portrayed as a British unit, was actually a unit of American volunteers known as the Royal Americans, formed in order to create a unit of soldiers who could fight in the woods. 
uh, as opposed to the more formal battle lines common in European warfare, but they are not portrayed that way in the movie. They're portrayed as uh, very much a standard British unit, uh, indeed a stereotypical British unit. Cora Monroe is a fictional character. She is the daughter of Colonel George Monroe. Um, she's recently arrived in New York from England, is going to join her father at Fort William Henry on the frontier, and she's a longtime friend of Duncan Haywood. Her little sister, also fictional, is Alice Monroe, um, and likewise has recently arrived from England, going with her sister to meet her father on the frontier. Her father, Lieutenant Colonel George Monroe, um, who some of the Indians call the Gray Hair, um, is an historical character, um, an actual person who did command British forces in Fort William Henry in New York during the French and Indian War, although um, he was not entirely like the characters shown in the movie. In reality, he did not have two daughters or indeed any children. Certainly no children visited him, him on active duty on the frontier of America. As we'll discuss later, some other important events in his life are pretty different than how they're shown in the movie. General Daniel Webb, in the movie, is an historical figure who served in New York during the French and Indian War, and his historical actions in the movie are more or less the way they're shown in the movie, um, although you know, with some minor variations. And for some reason, even though they must have known better, in the movie they say his name is Jerome rather than Daniel Webb. Magua is a fictional character, introduced as a Mohawk scout, and the Mohawk being part of the Iroquois League and allies of the British. It is his job early on to guide the Monroe sisters and Major Hayward to meet Colonel Monroe at Fort William Henry. He is portrayed by the Cherokee actor Wes Studi, who appears in, in many movies that need an American Indian uh, lead. Um, he, he was raised originally speaking Cherokee on his reservation in Oklahoma, when he went to school, he and the other Indian children were only allowed to speak English, would have their mouths washed out with soap if they tried to speak Cherokee. Um, and he also took part in the American Indian movement, was at the standoff at Wounded Knee in 1973. And finally, the Marquis de Montcalm um, was the French general in overall command in New France during the French and Indian War, did personally, as shown in the movie, lead troops um, besieging Fort William Henry, and is portrayed fairly accurately, although uh, yeah, not entirely. And so now um, we will watch the last of the Mogul.